Okay, everyone, welcome to the, the next session. So, um, this is going to be a conversation between SDG advocates, and uh, Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey Sachs will be here in a few moments. Uh, he was just caught in New York traffic, but he will be here in a few moments. So, I'm just going to temporarily fill in, just temporarily. Um, but today, this is a, a, what we call the Kapuskinski Lecture. And it's actually a big honor to do this uh, lecture. Oh, so, thank you. Um, and it's actually been webcast throughout the European Commission and the UNDP, so we can welcome them as well as our own audience here. Um, and uh, Kat Paskinski was obviously this great Polish writer who documented you know, issues in Africa you know, for all of us, so it's a, it's a very nice uh, lecture series to be Wonderful. involved in. Thank um, you. So I just want to introduce you to Edward uh, Ndupu, and he's basically an award-winning activist, humanitarian, and public intellectual. And he's one of the UN Sustainable Development Advocates. So I think what's interesting, particularly for young people, I always think, uh, he's a young person himself, but just to, just to tell his story about the road to activism and the role that you have at the moment, right? So just to hear that story, uh, I think it'll be interesting. And uh, we are going to try and have an interactive dialogue, so please put your questions on the hashtag ICSD219, and I think you, you do want to hear from them and to answer their questions yeah, as absolutely. well. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Um, so, first of all, let me just say how tremendously delighted I am to be with all of you here today. Um, I'm extraordinarily honored, and uh, particularly to be here in my capacity as one of the UN Secretary General's uh, advocates for the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, perhaps I'll start by making uh, a bit of an admission. Uh, my activism, uh, like so many people around the world, has been informed by my own lived experience. Uh, I was diagnosed at the age of two with a severe degenerative condition called spinal muscular atrophy. This is a motor neuron disease that affects the voluntary muscles and it results in progressive weakness. And so very early on, I realized that I needed to become my own advocate. Uh, I needed to teach the world how to treat me as a person with a physical disability. And I realized that by advocating for myself, I became deeply aware of the structural and social barriers that people with disabilities face all over the world. And so when I fought for um, my own access uh, into mainstream education, I realized that I had an opportunity to amplify the voices of other disabled people, particularly disabled young people. Um, and little did I know that you know, many years later, I'd end up becoming the first African with a degenerative disability to graduate from the University of Oxford. Hi, Jeff, how are you? Hi, Paul, how are you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. So this We're is having a conversation. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you. So this is like Professor Jeffrey Sachs is joining us, so a big welcome as well, thank please. Thank you. And I tell you, I'm going to leave you to. No, no, don't worry. You want me to stay? No, come yeah, on. Okay. I tell you, I'll watch the Twitter nice account and get Paul, the Paul, don't leave. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, my activism was informed by my own lived experience, and I think that is the magic of activism and advocacy, that it is about human stories, real people with real aspirations, real fears, real anxieties, um, and it's about, you know, flipping. I, I'm always curious about the Maslow hierarchy of needs and how we say that people first deserve adequate housing and infrastructure, and then they need safety. But I truly believe that we need to really spend more time inversing that and focusing on self-actualization. Because in the most neglected and vulnerable parts of the world, poor people and marginalized people are also artists and philosophers and thinkers and dreamers. They're full human beings. And in so many ways, I think that public <laughs> policy uh, needs to recognize that. We need to underscore the humanity and the value of people. And so that's what I do in my own advocacy, is recognizing that people with disabilities 
Um, you know, I'm a 20-something, I'm a millennial, and you know, I want young disabled people to feel like young disabled people, to be able to do all the things that our non-disabled counterparts do. And so I, I think that's part and parcel of the work. Um, it, it's really about affirming um, the humanity. You know, we often rattle off all of these statistics. Um, I come from a region in the world where approximately 90% of children with disabilities have never seen the inside of a classroom. Um, you know, about 32 million children with disabilities have no access to education whatsoever. Um, and, and these are horrifying statistics, but I think what's more horrifying is the way that we've sort of normalized that. We, we sort of made it seem as though, oh, okay, well, you know, they're kids and they're disabled and they're poor, um, but we don't recognize that the, that is potential that the world has been deprived of. Um, and so in my work, it, it really is about underscoring those human stories. I may have come late, but um, did you tell your own personal story a little bit? The early years, because I'm very curious. It's not easy. Yeah. Uh, your early years, mm -hmm. not only uh, your diagnosis early on, but with your mom. Yeah. How did you uh, escape the fate of uh, so many people that would have been in your position that would have been basically without yeah. hope. Sure. Uh, so, so my mom's in the audience, actually, and, yeah. and I'm quite delighted that she's. <laughs> we probably so, should hear from your mom. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, and I'm sure she, I mean, there, there is a memoir or two or three uh, that's within my mom, and I'm sure she'll, she'll tell that story one day. But I, I often share a very poignant moment that, that occurred in my own life. And it must have occurred when I was about five or six years old. Um, I remember, and, and I've shared the story many times, and, and my mom knows this, but I, I remember um, sitting on the linoleum floor of, of our home um, in Vintook, Namibia, and it was this you know late afternoon, and I would wait for my mom to get back um, from a hard days of work and then not wait for at home. And I remember sitting in front of the television screen, but it was completely switched off. And I was just staring at this blank TV screen and my mom walked in and you know, she sort of asked me, oh, well, what's wrong? Why are you looking at a TV screen that's blank? And I sort of paused um, for a moment and um, again, my mom asked the question, what, what, what's up, what's wrong? And I looked at her, and at the time, I so we're two brothers. Um, I have a younger brother, uh, and at the time he was in kindergarten, um, you know. And I looked at my mom and I said, "I want to go to school. I I want to be like my younger brother." And that became, uh, without me realizing it at the time, a seed was planted in terms of my own yearning for an education, but I, I think beyond that, it was a yearning for, for more, right? I, and, and my six-year-old brain didn't have language to articulate it at the time, but I think what it was yearning for, again, coming back to what I said earlier, was a deep sense of self-actualization, a deep sense of knowing that I could be worthy um, that I could live a dignified life despite having a severe disability um, and the nature of my disability is such that the older I get, the weaker I become. And I just was not having any of it. I was like, I am gonna grow up and I am gonna become everything that my imagination desires. And I think that became a catalyst and I realized that, um, that there's something there. Yeah. And uh, Windhoek was able to help you because that's also unusual. No, no. Jeff. So what happened? Not. <laughs> not sorry to be so naive, <laughs> but what happened then? What's the story? Well, no, it's a good question because um, so at the time, like so many African cities and cities all over the world, um, the mainstream education schools were completely unprepared. 
and we're running scared. You know, I you know that there were moments when my mom was looking everywhere, asking people, do you know of schools that could accommodate my, my boy who wants to go to school? And, you know, there were so many no's. There were so many rejections. And eventually, there was one school that sort of took a risk. They were like, we have no idea how this is going to work, but we're prepared to walk this journey with you. We're going to try and make it work. And I think that that is, was that a public school? It was a public school. It was, it, it was a very under-resourced school. So this, all the fancy schools were like, oh, no, this is not going to work. I mean, who's going to take care of him? Um, and eventually, the compromise, the reason why they accepted me into this particular school was that um, my mom said, well, I will find um, a, a caregiver to accompany him to school. And we'll, the caregiver will sit in the class, mm -hmm. and if he needs to use the bathroom or something like that, mm -hmm. we'll make it work. Mm -hmm. um, this time as well, they, they said that I should be sequestered into a special section of the class. But <laughs> something really funny happened. On, on the first day, um, you know, I was super excited, and you know, um, all the kids were being shown how to write our names. And I did something that the other kids couldn't do. I was actually able to write my name. And the teacher looked at me and she said, you don't belong in this section of the class. You should be with all the other kids. Um, yeah, and, and wow. that's, that was the, the beginning of, of uh, yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then uh, did you continue through public school the, the whole way? or? I did throughout. So I, I, I mean, there was no looking back. At that point, um, I continued on the path uh, in mainstream school. And eventually, uh, the family, we moved back to South Africa. Uh, that's where my mom is from. Um, so here we are, post-apartheid South Africa. Um, I'm continuing on this trajectory. And I eventually ended up doing really well in school. I, no I excelled. <laughs> I excelled, and I, I got a scholarship to the African Leadership Academy, um, and then got another scholarship to go to Canada, graduated with high distinction, and then ended up going to Oxford a few years later. Um, so what years were you at Carleton, by the way? Oh, um, so, OK, I have to say something here. Yeah, OK. So this feels so surreal, being on the stage, because exactly 10 years ago, I applied to Columbia. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I applied to Columbia. I've never been on the admissions <laughs> committee. <laughs> and I was on the waiting list. I, I didn't get in. Um, but it's all good. I'm here now. <laughs> Um, but uh, my, I, so during that same time, I, I obviously applied to other institutions as well. And I think, again, the biggest challenge was around accommodating my degenerative disability. So I need assistance with pretty much everything, feeding, um, y you name it. I mean, I, yeah, everything. Um, and, and, you know, again, it became a challenge. You know, many institutions of higher learning were kind of scared. They were like, can we do this, right? And I was like, of course you can, I'm, you know? Uh, but, you know, so Carleton University in Canada, um, they had this very interesting model where uh, students would uh, play the role of, the, they, they would essentially be caregivers. And it's this 24 hour service, seven days a week, and they'd work in shifts and they would actually wow provide the care, and it's integrated into the entire university. Incredible. So that was very innovative, and I thought, well, that's the place I want to be. And, and it was a, a life-changing moment, because during those years, I think I really began to shift my own worldview in relation to myself and how I saw myself. Um, I, I think it was the first time in my life that I was truly independent those years. Uh, and it, it was transformative wow. uh, in, in Did you come across, Carleton had a big Millennium Development Goal program, student yeah. program. Yeah. Did you come across that? I did, I did. And, and at the time, I think that's what really ignited my activism and my advocacy. 
um, I began, you know, really caring about the world in a very deep way. Wow. Um, you, know, you know, Brian I, Turner, by the way. I, I, you know I, the name of of yeah yeah, yeah. yeah but not we we've, we've never okay. met. Um, so so it, but it was. Uh, Carlton had done a wonderful thing. A student there uh, had started a uh, a campaign actually that students would contribute a certain amount each semester. Mm -hmm to the Millennium Development Goals. Goals right. and a wonderful young man uh, started that, and I went to Carleton a couple of times to speak to the students, and I was amazed at the ethos yeah. of, of the campus. Yeah. And you're, I think you're yeah. explaining that also. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and, and I think it's a sense of interdependence, the recognition that we all need one another in the world. Um, and I, I realized that the world, um, sort of speaks about independence as though there are no structural conditions that make independence possible, right? So, you know, everything is designed to accommodate non-disabled people, right? But you sort of tell yourselves that you're independent without recognizing the structural conditions that make independence possible. And I realized that actually that, that's, you know, a bit of a misnomer that, you know, we, we need to create conditions that support independent life that support autonomy and human agency and human dignity. Um, and, and that ethos, I think, really helped me think that through. Eddie and I are lucky to be part, uh, you, you may have explained it, yeah, part of the uh, advocates for the Sustainable Development Goals, so this is a, a great thing. So let me get your advice. <laughs> what should we be doing uh, on yeah. the issues of inclusion for disability? It, systematically, how should we be sure. reorganizing? Sure. Um, that's a great question. And I must say, I'm tremendously delighted to be serving with you in this capacity. And we're delighted to, uh, I mean, the whole group is thrilled that, that you're part of this and your leadership is part of it. Thank you. Um, so I think what needs to happen in the context of inclusion is, so several years ago, I found myself being incredibly frustrated by the entire conversation around inclusion and access and disability. And I, for the longest time, I, I didn't know where my rage was coming from, and I was really enraged. And then I realized I was enraged because because I felt that we were talking about access to the built environment and we end the conversation there. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel as though I had adequate access to joy and belonging and intimacy. And I figured that there was something a bit off about the way we're speaking about disability. It's as though, you know, if you're able to get on a bus and public transit or if you're able to get into the building, hooray, we've accomplished inclusion for people with disabilities, and I found myself being incredibly annoyed. <laughs> um, and then I realized, oh, what's happening is that people with disabilities around the world are operating at negative 10, but zero is the aspiration for what is possible for our humanity. And I was frustrated because I want to move beyond zero. I want to move beyond compliance, I want to move beyond the ramp. And I realize that public policymakers tend to set the bar very low, mm -hmm. particularly when we speak about the global south. It's which is, which the, is terrible right. in that we never quite reached the bar also. Right, so that, you might as right. well set the bar higher so that you're reaching more. And I think that's precisely the tragedy of, of, of where we are, right? Is, is that you're absolutely right, Jeff, is that we're not even getting to zero. But we're speaking about human beings, and, and human beings are not going to be satisfied with just zero. <laughs> because they see other human beings living beyond zero. Yeah. And so they're like, well, wait a minute. If, if, we, if our humanity is the same, and we say that we all embody inalienable rights, then surely we should all be aspiring 
for more than negative 10. Uh, and, and, and so this concept of moving beyond zero, I think crystallized for me that when we speak about inclusion and representation, that we need those that are furthest behind the line to come to the front, but not just come to the front so that we all feel good about ourselves, but to come to the front because we recognize leadership within them, we recognize humanity, we recognize value. Um, and so for me, I want to see a world where people with disabilities are able to achieve extraordinary things, right? I, I want them to be able to not just um, get education, but to have access to employment and decent work. And so the SDGs for me offer us an opportunity to look at people in a very holistic way, in a very comprehensive way, um, not in a very basic kind of sense of international development, but we recognize that there is possibility for the world to converge to higher standards of living, but also to converge to a, a sense of human agency and self-actualization. What do we do next? What do you do next? Aye, aye, aye. Hmm? Um, How do we help? I, so yesterday, we, we, you know, the, we kick-started the general debate um, at the UN General Assembly. And uh, I found myself, it, it was this. A little, little uh, bizarre, wasn't it? Uh, uh, well, when the president oh, stood oh, up? Oh, yeah, that, that was. If Very you start with Bolsonaro and Trump, uh, you're in for a surreal morning. Uh, and uh, th that, that's exactly how we, we started. So it was uh, really quite a picture of the world. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. that's exactly what I yeah. said. <laughs> uh, th that was surreal, but I think what was also surreal for me was looking around the hall and seeing all of these leaders. Um, it was the most powerful room in the world that day, right? And I looked around and I was the only person in a wheelchair in the entire hall. And I was a little emotional and, and I kind of held back tears because I, I was like, there are 1.3 billion people with disabilities approximately 15% or so of the global population. At least 15% of this room should have, I, I, I also recognize that some disabilities are invisible, but still, I, 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 th there was a profound lack of representation, meaningful representation. And so to your point, to answer your question in terms of what we need to do next, I think we need to support leaders from neglected, vulnerable, and marginalized segments of society to be able to have meaningful participation and a seat at the table where the future of humanity is being decided, right? And if we are serious about leaving nobody behind and we want to give credence to this notion of leaving nobody behind, then it becomes a moral imperative as well, you know, as, as well as a political imperative, but it becomes a more, it's an ethical, the ethical thing to do is to really open the doors so that people who are underrepresented are able to have a seat at the table, right? Last year, by the way, uh, I don't know if you know uh, President Moreno of Ecuador? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. He is in a wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, shot and uh, partially paralyzed uh, many years ago, and he went up to the podium at the General Assembly and was very beautiful. You weren't there last I year. I wasn't, no. He, uh, he started out, he's very funny also, by the way, he's got a great he's sense of humor, sense he's hilarious, of humor. but he started out to, in a very moving way saying that I'm here in a wheelchair, mm. you may feel sorry for me, don't. Yeah. Uh, my life is very good, and it's very different if I were standing 
I would be looking down on you, but I'm sitting and I'm looking face to face with you, and that's much better for me and right. much better for you. And it was a very moving, beautiful, beautiful remark. And I think, you know, the greatest president this country ever had by far mm -hmm. was in a wheelchair, yes. Franklin Roosevelt. Absolutely. Uh, one of the most gifted statesmen, leaders in modern history who invented the UN, uh, among other things. And uh, uh, your point is very well illustrated uh, by that precisely. Well, I, so, I, I, I think, but how do we ensure that it's not just two or three people in history yep. that are able to access that building? I mean, I, we now speak about universal design and, you know, I, we can modify buildings in such a way that we're able to really accord access. Um, you know, I was kind of sitting on the side. Um, there was sort of a space because the seats aren't, they're all sort of collapsible and yep. it, all these barriers around them. Um, and, and because of that, I, I didn't have access to the translation. And, you know, so I, I, oh. it's not that, you know, it's, they're very practical You didn't things miss that, that because, much, by the way. I, I was, uh, so I was told, somebody said to me, yes, it's like, actually, it was, I don't it think was so bizarre it, you right. were saying, is that really what they're right. saying? <laughs> I, I read the transcript after, I'm like, okay, I think maybe I was fine. Um, so, but, but I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that I, I think that we are at this incredible moment in history where we're able to leverage the wonders of science and technology and the fourth industrial revolution to be able to, in a very meaningful way, bring about inclusion in the way that we design our buildings and the way that we uh, configure spaces um, that radically transform them to bring about equity and equality. Um, and, and so that's what I hope to do with the platform that I have now. We'll, we'll give it all the help possible. And I was, uh, reminded uh, something very interesting, but I think it's you know, replicated everywhere in the world. Two of our colleagues uh, here, Karen uh, and Erwin Redlener, uh, I don't know if you know them, but these are wonderful, uh, they're both wonderful leaders of public health uh, at Columbia University. They did a survey of kids coming into New York City public schools uh, for disability, but just basic eyesight correction, yeah. for example, hearing, and so on. And kids are not even screened at all yeah. for things that could completely yeah. uh, improve their lives, improve their, I mean, make it possible for them to study and so on. So they are, they've instituted a screening program, but it's not even scaled up yet yeah. in yeah. this city. Yeah. So I think also thinking about those kinds of mechanisms yeah survey data, ways to make sure that kids are um, seen properly to, right. to be helped and so on is something we could take up. Yeah. There's a question from the audience. I think it's a very good one. Um, so they're saying, can, it's Ava, she gets, can anything be done by ordinary people or can it only be, is it only the responsibility of government for, for people with disabilities? So you could say this about the SDGs as well. What do you, what do you think, what can they do rather than waiting for somebody else to do? Well, I, I think we're already doing, I, 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 you know, people, we, we're working on the SDGs every day without even realizing it. Um, our deep concern about the climate crisis um, and how visceral and emotional and scary that feels for our own lives, um, we take action by by, by, by integrating our full selves into the discourse and into the conversation. It does not exist outside of us. We are living, we, we are living in this moment that requires of us to reach for the SDGs in a very meaningful way. And I think maybe the, the disconnect or the disjuncture is in public policymakers speaking about these issues as though they exist as, as this sort of very abstract, nebulous thing that's not in any way connected to our lives. We're in, an act, in actual fact, 
the moment we, we, we leave our homes and go out into the world to work or to go to school or to live our lives, we are confronted with injustice every day. We're confronted with the reality um, of, 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 of the climate and, and, and of all of the big major issues that we are trying to grapple with. We're living them every day. So I think it's about connecting to the issues um, and asking yourself, what kind of world do you want to live in? Or what kind of world do you want to live, live, for, your, live for your children? Um, so it, it, we need that emotional connection to these issues. Um, and to speak out against injustice. I mean, I am incredibly inspired by young people mm -hmm. all over the world right now who are just speaking truth to power in the most incredible way. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried. I'm, I'm actually like, yeah, it's happening, whether you like it or not. We are changing the trajectory of humanity, and, and that's exciting. There's another question, but I'm, I'm not sure. This is... Um, This idea of how do people, in a sense, learn this idea of the victim mentality for people, how do we get, uh, get over this, you know, when we're chatting with uh, people with disability, like, so how? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, and I want to be careful how I answer that, because I think we often, um, I think we often individualize experiences of exclusion without looking at the structural conditions that made victimization happen, right? And so I, th I, th I think it's both, right? I, I think that we, off we, we need to promote empowerment so that people feel good about themselves. We need examples. It, it was hard for me because I, th there are very few there were very few people I could turn to in my own life. I had no point of reference. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to become my own point of reference and my own example of possibility. And I realized that my job now is to be a point of reference mm -hmm. um, and, and to be able to demonstrate to children, particularly children with disabilities, that they can grow up to become the, the protagonists in the story of their own lives, right? That they are the ones that they've been waiting for. So I, I, I know how important having a point of reference is and role modeling in order to build your self-esteem. But in the absence of that, I think that falling into a, a kind of victimization mentality is almost, it's almost inevitable. And, and I kind of wish that we were a little bit more gentle and a little bit more compassionate with people who are experiencing grave trauma and, and, and grave injustice to really empathize with them in a very meaningful way and in a very genuine way and just think about how one has to be resourceful when you have no idea where your next meal is coming from and, and what that does to a person's sense of self and emotional well-being. So, Yes, I, 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 I don't see myself as a victim. Um, and I'm compassionate towards people who find themselves victimized mm -hmm. by injustice and inequality. Does that make sense? Yes, beautiful. Not only yeah. makes sense, I want to meet your mom because. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she's right there in the second row. Bravo. Amazing. She must be pretty amazing. She is. What does your brother do, by the way? My brother, um, so uh, it's a, so my brother was recently diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy. Um, oh. And 
It's uh, so this is as an adult. As an adult, so he has type three SMA, which means he was diagnosed much later. Uh, I think now a good four or five years ago. And uh, it's a different experience because I, this is all I've ever known. I've, I've always um, lived with SMA. I've always been disabled. And so it's so much a part of who I am and my identity. But I guess for somebody who's lived their lives able-bodied for such a long time, there's a different devastation and a different trauma that kicks in. Um, so my younger brother is incredibly intelligent. He's the most, he's the smartest person I've ever met. Um, Somehow I'm not shocked that he's <laughs> uh, intelligent. <laughs> um, and, and so in terms of what he does, I think he's processing. He's coming to terms with his new life mm -hmm. and trying to figure out the best way he can how to navigate that. Um, and, you know, I feel that I can support him by really showing him what's possible, by showing him, you know, uh, so I'll just mention this because I think it's a really good segue, is that I, so I'm currently working on this crazy ambitious goal. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm setting the wheels in motion, no pun intended, um, of becoming the first physically disabled person to travel into space. And the goal, and, and I want to be careful here because people hear that and they're like, oh my God, that is so cool. You're going to have this great adventure. But space, I, I, I want to harness my voyage to deliver a message to the world from space, a live broadcast beamed to the UN and addressing world leaders All on right. <laughs> the importance of leaving nobody behind, but also as a symbol of possibility. I describe it as my love letter um, to the enduring power of the human spirit, right? And so that impossible feat, and, and in so doing so, I mean, there, there's another point is that, you know, if we can send a person with a disability into space, then we can also fix some things here on Earth mm -hmm. And, and reach the SDGs. So, so this is the goal that I'm working on, and, and I hope to do that next year. With Branson? Um, we're in conversation. All right, good. Yeah. Can you smuggle some other uh, SDG advocates on board? Well, I'm, I'm looking at you now because I think you can help me with messaging as well. Right. So I'm, I'm going to call on you. All right, good. I'm going to call on you for help. Um, but, but, but that, that sounds like this massive goal, but it, it has to be massive. It has to be bold and larger than life because I think what underpins that is a really simple message that, you know, that the human spirit can really achieve extraordinary things. And as an SDG advocate, I think that's what we are assisting the Secretary General with is as we ha approach this decade of action uh, and delivery, um, it seems impossible and it seems like there's no way we're going to reach all of these things by 2030. But if we can illuminate examples, right? Phenomenal. Of possibility and, and create this positive feedback loop where, you know, the more extraordinary moments we have, it results in greater ambition, and that results in greater ambition and greater ambition, then it is, it's perfectly doable that by the year 2030, we're able to deliver on the agenda for sustainable development. All right. I have, I have to ask you one more question before sure. we finish. Where did you get that? absolutely cool SDG badge, because yours sparkles, <laughs> mine doesn't, so. Uh. Actually, Jeff, I think they have one for you. Do you think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could yeah. you swing that? I could. All right. I've got you. <laughs> I've got you. Um, so this was uh, designed uh, by uh, the Swarovski company, and yeah, the crystals okay. are sustainably sourced. Um, and so Nadia Swarovski was at the UN, so she gave a whole bunch of us. Whoa, spin. I knew so there I'm was not a good sure answer to that. that day. <laughs> no, no, okay, I'm going to need your poll for that, right. but I want one of those. <laughs>
You Eddie, thank it. you so much. Oh, Your you. leadership is pleasure. absolutely inspiring, and thank it's you. such a joy to be doing this together with you. Thank you. Thank you so much.